we can get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Daniela Rossiti. I am a curator at WormBase. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the fourth webinar of the 2020 WormBase webinar series. In today's webinar, Chris Grove will give an overview of WormMine, one of the data mining tools available at WormBase. A couple of housekeeping notes before we begin. The presentation itself will take about 40 minutes and will be followed by a 20 minutes Q&A session. We will be muting all participants during the presentation to avoid interruptions. And we encourage you to type questions in the chat panel at any time. A chat moderator will be collecting all the questions and we will answer them at the end of Chris' presentation during the Q&A session. Uh, the webinar, including the Q&A session, will be recorded and will be posted at a later date on YouTube. We will inform you via the WormBase blog when it will be available. If you have additional questions after the webinar, uh, or if you need further clarifications, you can always reach us at help at wormbase.org. Again, it's help at wormbase.org. Thank you again for joining us. We're really pleased that you are all here. Uh, without further ado, uh, here is our speaker for the day, Chris Grove. Chris, are you ready to start? Yep. Thanks, Daniela. Right. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm going to put up a pointer. All right. I'm putting up this pointer, but I'm going to try to use it sparingly. Um, so, welcome to the uh, Worm Based webinar um, on Worm Mine, an introduction to Worm Mine. My name is Chris Grove, as Daniela said. Um, I'm going to take you through a brief introduction of WormMind. Uh, 40 minutes is not enough time to cover everything about WormMind, but I'm hoping I can get to a lot of the basics and help you understand what is in WormMind, how to access it, how to understand it, and how to be aware of cer certain gotchas or pitfalls that um, can, can commonly happen when, when querying with the tool. Um, so first, uh, of course, I'd like to acknowledge the entire WormBase team uh, for all their great efforts in bringing you uh, WormBase and all of its tools, data, and resources. Um, the, in particular, today, I'd like to thank Paolo Nguyen, who's our lead uh, WormMind developer at WormBase, uh, and also um, who, Paolo gets a um, uh, great amount of development support from our OICR group leader, Todd Harris. Um, so, first of all, uh, what is WormMine? Why use it? Um, the WormMine is, uh, in quote from the website, Intermine Data Mining Platform for C. elegans and Related Nematodes. Um, so, the important bit there is it's a data mining platform. That's correct. So, what is Intermine? Well, Intermine is a software uh, package that uh, basically takes in data from uh, several different model organism databases, uh, genomic and gene related data, um, and basically processes it and provides it in a standard user interface or via standard APIs uh, that can access the data programmatically. Um, there's a number of different um, versions, as you can see in the bottom here. I think FlyMine was the first. Uh, now there's YeastMine, ZebraFish Mine, et cetera. Um, so why use it? Well, uh, first, it's a very fast and powerful query tool. Um, compared to a lot of tools out there, it can return tables of hundreds of thousands or even, time, even millions of rows uh, in a relatively short amount of time. Uh, it also has programmatic access via an API, um, including APIs for various languages, including Python and Perl and, and some others. Um, much of the worm-based data is now available for querying in WormMind. Uh, it has pre-canned template queries and uh, lists of class instances. Um, and I'll describe what I mean by that a little bit later, but it has lists of genes, uh, lists of phenotypes, things that might be of interest to people uh, first coming to WormMind. For example, I'll mention later, um, they now have a list of C. elegans uh, transcription factor genes uh, according to various criteria. Um, you can also create a personal account so that you can log in and save your queries and your lists and some other uh, information uh, so that and that will those, that information should persist um, from one release to the next so that you can always come back, log in and look at your uh, saved lists of genes or your favorite genes or uh, favorite queries and so forth. 
Also, uh, WormMind makes it easy to, um, once you've created a, a query, you can actually share it quite easily. Uh, and I'll explain how to do that. And this is useful for collaboration or troubleshooting. If you're collaborating with somebody on a project and you want to send them the query, or if you're troubleshooting the query and it's not working quite right, you can send it to WormBase. We can take a look and help you um, figure out how to maybe, maybe modify the query to get it to work properly. Um, so before I jump into WormMind, I'd like to talk a little bit about WormBase data classes and just data classes in general. So if you come to WormBase, you're probably familiar with our main search bar. If you click on the um, for anything, or usually it says for a gene, you can actually see a list of um, a subset of all the WormBase classes that we have available. And basically, a, a data class in WormBase is a set of data entities or data objects. It's a set of, uh, for example, genes or a set of proteins or strains. And um, so you can see here a list of very common classes that you might want to query when you come to WormBase. Anatomy, if you're looking for a particular cell or tissue or organ. Uh, gene, you can look up your favorite set of genes and find a gene page for that. You can look up papers, strains, variations, and alleles, and so, and so forth. Uh, in, in case you didn't already know, you can actually get an extended list of classes that are available in WormBase by clicking on the directory uh, menu uh, header. As if you just click on that, you actually get to this page where you can see an extended list of classes that you can query in the database. And as I said, a, a data class in WormBase really is a set of uh, data objects or data entities uh, that have various attributes and have associations um, to other classes. And really it's a, it's a set of instances as I'll call them. So we have a set of gene instances. We have you know, the AAP1 gene, we have the DAF2 gene, we have the EGL1 gene. Each of those is a data entity in the gene class in, in WormBase. So let's take, for example, the gene class uh, as I was just referring to. So um, as with the gene classes, with many other classes, it has many instances of the database. For example, uh, the gene identified by the primary unique identifier, WBGene 00000001, uh, which also known by its public name as AAP1. Uh, so as I just alluded to, each instance uh, of a class in the database has a unique primary identifier, like this WGB gene identifier. Um, each instance may have data attributes consisting of only numbers or text. So for example, many genes have a public name or a gene name attribute like AAP1. Clone genes have a sequence name attribute like Y110A7A.10. Uh, and clone genes uh, may also have a length attribute like 2341 uh, is an integer uh, referring to the base pair units. Um, so, also, in addition to data attributes, each instance of a class in the database may have associations to other instances uh, of a class. It could be the same class like gene, so you could have a gene to gene association, or that instance could have an association to, the inst to an instance of a different class, like allele or variation. So, for example, we have the gene AAP1, and it has orthology to the C. Briggsy gene CBR AAP1. So that would be an example of a, a database association that is a gene to gene association. Uh, additionally, we might have the gene AAP1 has, um, has an allele TM713 with a WB bar identifier as its primary identifier. And that would be an example of a gene to variation or allele association. Uh, so the point here is that we have classes. The classes have instances in the database, and each instance can have data attributes or associations to um, other instances from, um, from another class or the same class. If we were to kind of visualize this graphically, um, we could uh, think of each class instance as a node in the database in a graph. So the first case, we have a, an instance of the gene class, gene A. It has this WB gene ID, this name and length. Uh, and it has, and this also has an association, not a data attribute, but an, uh, a class uh, instance association to another instance uh, in the database of the allele or variation class, allele X. And this particular allele has a 
because of the var ID as a unique identifier as a name TM713, and it may have an attribute like database in which we store as text the name National Bioresource Project. So I just wanted to get that out of the way so that we understand kind of what we're working with. We have data classes. Each class is a set of instances that have attributes and properties, some of which are data attributes, and some of the properties are actually connections to other uh, instances in the database. So now I'll dive into WormMind. Um, uh, getting to WormMind uh, is simply a matter of looking in the tools menu and then looking under data mining and batch queries, we have the WormMind link out. You can click it, click on that and get to the WormMind homepage. And um, from here, this is the breakdown of the anatomy of this homepage. The, at the top, we have WormMind pages and tabs that takes you to all the different um, types of pages or interfaces that uh, WormMind provides. Um, we have an entity search box, so you can search for a gene or a protein or some other entity or a keyword. Um, there's an analyze list box. That's, this allows you to choose if you want to uh, query for a uh, query a list of genes or alleles um, or just create a list of these things in, uh, in one mind. So you can do that right there. There's also a take a tour button that takes you to our user guide on our wiki page. And then in the bottom, uh, we see a bunch of tabs like genomics, proteins, expression, and so forth. These are all uh, template queries that are organized by topic. And so um, it, it'd be useful when you first come to WormMind just to browse these uh, template queries uh, here on the home page under these various tabs or at the templates tab at the very top, you can see the full list of template queries we have. Uh, and this will give you a list of options that you may wanna take a look at to see if we already have constructed the query you're looking for, and then you can just go ahead and, and customize it and do perform the query that you're looking to do. Um, so that's everything on the uh, on the home page. What I'd like to do is dive right into querying uh, with the query builder. Um, and we'll start simple and just build up from there. Um, so if we click on the query builder tab, we get to the query builder uh, home page. Um, and right here now on the on the right, we have a list of uh, worm mine data classes. These are analogous to worm based data classes, but they're they're not exactly identical to those classes. Um, and I should also point out that there's um, there, these are not entirely overlapping, that there are um, a few worm-based classes that are not in WormMind, either for technical reasons or they just haven't gotten in there yet, um, like interactions. Or uh, there'll be WormMind-specific classes, which are classes that are kind of instantiated by the Intermind software and come bundled with the software package. Um, and so uh, we make use of them in WormMind as well. Um, so um, we can first start with our query by selecting which data type or which class we want to query for. And basically what you're doing here is you're saying uh, of all the different classes of things in the, in the WormMind uh, database, what do we want to get a list back of? So if I click on gene and, and query by the gene data class, it means I want back a list of genes that fit a certain set of criteria. And then in addition, uh, to getting a particular set of genes, I may want certain data associated with them, uh, either data attributes or to look to drill down into the associations to other classes, um, class instances. So uh, I can click on this gene uh, and I can either double click or I can click on this select button and it'll take me now to the query builder for the gene class. Um, so this is really the main interface for building a query in WormMind. You can see the model browser on your left. Um, you can see uh, the data attributes that this that a, a, any particular instance of the gene class may have, including uh, names and identifiers, length and so forth, brief descriptions. And these are all basically just text or number uh, data uh, linked to that instance. And then alternatively below that, we have associations to other class instances. So, you know, as I said before, a gene may have an association to an allele. And so that would be captured under the, uh, the allele class in this model browser. Uh, genes may also have a chromosome, location, expression clusters, expression patterns, and so forth. Um, and, um, and 
the, these data attributes and these class of instance associations are a little bit different um, in that you don't um, you, you can select individual data attributes to show in your output table. Uh, it's not uh, it's not really precise to say we're just going to show uh, an entire class in the output table. You really need to expand each class and say of the say alleles associated with my gene of interest, I need to know what data to put in the output table about each of those alleles. I hope that will become clearer as we move forward. So you'll see that there's these buttons next to these data attributes and they say show and constrain. And so here are the show buttons right next to the ID and name attributes listed. Um, so basically to start building your query, you need to click on the show button to bring that attribute into your query overview uh, and, and tell OneMind that that's something you want back in your results table. So you can click on, for example, the show button next to Wormbase gene ID and this will then pull that attribute into the query overview to tell you what you can expect in your output table. And so right now, this would basically produce uh, a single column table with all gene IDs, um, worm-based gene IDs uh, for all genes in the database with no constraints. Um, so this is the simplest and most basic query you can perform in a particular class, like for genes. Uh, so we can click on the show results button and we get back uh, uh, a very large column um, involving more than 750 gene, uh, 750,000 genes. So this is the total gene count of all genes in one line. Uh, note that this includes C. elegans genes, it includes other nematodes um, and maybe some other flatworms uh, and their orthologs and other species. Uh, so usually we have a complete set of genes for C. elegans and other nematodes. Uh, for human and fruit fly and rat and mouse, we have genes, but those genes are all usually only representing um, those that have some um, uh, orthology relationship to one of the nematode genes. Uh, anyway, so this isn't a very informative query. We just pulled out an entire the entire list of genes. Uh, that's held in one line. So if we go back up here to where it says trail, we can click on the query button to go back to our query that we were constructing. Now, um, I want to put in a, a, some more attributes here. I don't want to just get a single column with the one based gene ID. I also want, let's say, sequence name and gene name. So I click on the show buttons next to each of those and subsequently get the attributes pulled into the query overview. Now, um, let's say I don't want all uh, all genes, I want to limit my list to a particular set um, for uh, individual gene based on a set of criteria. So uh, as you'll notice, in addition to the show button next to these data attributes, we have a constrain button. And if you click on that, you'll get a dialog box that shows you um, something like this, where there's two sections to this dialog box. One is the top, it says uh, filter query results on a specific value. So you can enter a specific value or even a pattern, as I'll get to this momentarily, uh, to say, I want the gene name, uh, I want all the genes in, that I'm returning in for my query to have a gene name that fits this criteria. And I'll get back to that in just a moment. You can also uh, do this, when, uh, apply a general uh, filter query for whether or not this attribute has or does not have a value. And this can be handy in a number of different cases like if you want to know all the genes that um, don't have an allele or all the uh, genes that don't have an RNAi phenotype or something like that. That's something you can query by saying give me all the, the genes that don't have that attribute. Um, and so that can be uh, handy. Now in this case I'm going to just pull up the gene we already discussed, AAP1. Uh, I'm going to put it in here with the equals uh, comparator. Uh, and then I click on add to query, and now I've added a constraint to my query. And so now basically what I'm asking for is to return a single AAP1 gene or any genes for which the, the name gene name equals AAP1. Uh, and for that gene, return the form based gene ID, the sequence name, and the gene name. So I'm going to click on show results and uh, see a, a simple table with one row representing this gene with its WB gene ID, 
sequence name, you know, just gene name. Um, so now I'll just go back uh, to the query and adjust my constraint. Now I could go back to the gene name and click on constraint and add a new constraint. But if I want to edit my existing constraint to be gene name being AAP1, I can click on this little blue pencil icon. That is an edit button for the constraint. You click on that constraint and you bring back the dialog box with the AAP1 name already uh, pre-populated from your prior constraint. Um, and now I'm going to change this to something else. And now I'm going to change it to, um, instead of typing in AAP1, I'm going to type EGL dash asterisk. Now, what this query will do is it says, give me back all genes for which the gene name starts with EGL dash and is followed by anything else. So this, uh, as you might guess, can return all of the Eggl genes that are available in the database. In particular, C. elegans Eggl genes, as there's no uh, prefix from the other um, core one uh, nematodes like C. Briggsy, which starts with CBR and so forth. So this will return all of C. elegans Eggl genes. So I'll add this to my query, run the query, and as you can see, I'm getting 43 uh, genes back, 43 rows for all of the Eggl genes um, in C. elegans, starting with Eggl1 and going up from there. Um, now, if I come back to my query constraints, um, you can apply the equals operator there, but there's also a drop down menu that allows you to select um, a, a different comparators. Like maybe you, you want it to be not equals to. So the exclamation point equal sign generally means not equals. So you can uh, restrict it to genes that don't have the Eggle dash pattern. Uh, and if you just want to say it contains this text anywhere, um, it could be in a, in a name, an identifier, or a long string description or something like that. Then you can just put in contains and just put in a keyword and, and get uh, results back um, for which, in this case, the gene name contains a, some bit of text or some pattern. Um, I'd also like to point out that in addition to asterisk, you can also use question marks to indicate um, uh, individual characters. Uh, so in this case, you're actually asking for the pattern of only Eggl genes um, where it's an Eggl dash and then two digits. So um, th this may come up in, in various circumstances uh, where more recently I discovered this because uh, Mark Edgley was writing in looking for GK alleles um, that only had four digits because these are likely to not be part of the million mutation project. So. I was querying for an allele, I would put GK, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, and that would pull out alleles with four digits as opposed to say six from the million mutation project. In any case, that's another thing you can do. Uh, you can query for it, and now you can see the single digit Eggle gene names have been excluded, and now we're just completely with double digits. Okay, so coming back to this query, it's constraints removed. Um, I'm going to, uh, I want to now constrain on just a species. Uh, this is one of the more important types of constraints you might want to do when querying genes in one line. So uh, on the left model browser here, we're going to scroll down a bit until we find this organism uh, class, and uh, we're going to constrain that. So basically, uh, each gene instance in uh, WormMind or in WormBase has a, a species association. In WormMind, the class is called organism. And that in each uh, instance of organism has various attributes, including name. We're going to constrain the name of the organism uh, instance in Worm Mind um, that this that any of these genes are connected to to be the species that we want. So we'll click on that constraint uh, for the organism name. We'll be provided with a dialog box that provides a drop down menu, and we can choose of all the species that are. Uh, uh, indexed into this for mine instance, we will uh, choose C. elegans. And then we can add that to our query. And now we can query all C. elegans genes. When we show the results, now we get a table of 49,187 rows that represents the total C. elegans gene count, including coding and non coding genes uh, in C. elegans that are in for mine as of the WS279 release. Um, Excuse me. Um, so on the note of species and data in general, um, I'm just going to take a quick aside to point out that 
uh, I've put together a Google sh uh, spreadsheet uh, to compare the various worm-based data mining tools uh, on various properties, including what uh, data or attributes um, or, uh, or classes that that particular data mining tool will take in as input for a query, uh, what types of output will be provided by that tool, and then also what species are covered. Uh, so when we're, we intend to share these slides with all of you, so uh, there's a Google uh, spreadsheet URL li uh, link there. Uh, feel free to, to link over to that um, and take a look. And in, uh, if, it, if it isn't already clear, an X means that the data is present or that species is, is covered or is present, uh, a lack of an X absence. Um, so you can get a feel for uh, what species and what data types are covered. Uh, okay, so we're back to our um, query builder for the gene class where we've constrained the organism to be C. elegans. Um, <clears throat> now I'm gonna show you a different type of constraint you might wanna do on the gene class. Uh, and for this constraint, we could actually click on um, the constraints at the top, right next to the gene and the summary button. Uh, but we can also click on gene name uh, constraint. And, and if you have lists, uh, pre-canned lists of genes already loaded into your, your version of WormMind, um, then you can also constrain on a list. It doesn't have to uh, fit some sort of pattern or um, uh, the gene name doesn't have to be a particular text. You can actually just tell it, I want, um, the genes that come back to be, to be genes coming from this list. And so we have a number of uh, gene lists already available. I'm going to select C. elegans transcription factor genes, uh, and then I'm going to add this to my query. So uh, now I've constrained uh, the list so that I'm getting C. elegans genes back um, that belong to the list C. elegans transcription factor genes. Um, at this, uh, when you add about two or more constraints, you'll notice that the constraints logic will now be displayed. The current constraint logic in this case is A and B, meaning apply both constraints equally. Um, and there's a constraint logic edit button. You can select that, click on that and make an edit so that you could change it to, for example, A or B. Um, when you get more complex sets of constraints, you can use parentheses to separate out and you could say A and parentheses, B or C, close parentheses, uh, things like that to make a kind of a more uh, sophisticated constraint logic. Now, um, this C. elegans organism constraint, it's a bit redundant with the fact that we're already constraining on the, the pre canned list of C. elegans transcription factor genes. So, uh, I just want to point out that these little red X icons are delete uh, icons. Uh, the one on the bottom points to is right next to our constraint for C. elegans. You can delete that, click on that to delete the constraint, or you can click on it, the icon next to an attribute and delete that attribute from the query. So right now I'm just going to delete the C. elegans constraint because it's redundant. And now we're back to this query um, where we're just looking for the gene ID, sequence name, and gene name for all C. elegans transcription factor genes. Now, let's say uh, I, I want to expand my query to look at um, all of these C. elegans transcription factor genes and their alleles. I want to see what mutations or alleles are available. So now what I'll do is I'll go down to um, this allele class, um, as indicated, and I'm going to click on this little plus icon. And this will expand open uh, the allele class. And basically what you're seeing underneath this allele is pretty much what you would see if you went to the query builder instance for the allele class. And you'd see all of its attributes. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit. And you're going to see all of the data attributes and class uh, associated classes. Um, and you might, at first, when you're querying a particular class, you might see a lot of tags and attributes. and it might be a little overwhelming. So there's this uh, summary button next, uh, next to each class that allows you to select uh, just what WormMind considers to be the default minimal set of attributes that one might want for a particular class. In this case, if we click on summary for the allele class, it'll, it'll return uh, simply the public name. 
what would be like base information you might want back uh, about an allele associated to your genes in the list. Um, in addition to public name, I usually like to get back the worm base ID um, because that's usually a, a unique primary identifier and it's helpful to have uh, in your results. So I'm going to go to the worm base ID data attribute, click on show, see that populate in the query overview. Now, at this point, I just want to point out that the order of columns that your table has when you get it back will be um, the order in which you've selected the attributes. So if you want to customize the order of columns in your table, in your output table, um, but you don't want it to necessarily be the order in which you uh, selected the attributes while building the query, you can scroll down a little bit to the section where it says field selected for output. And you can see these, um, it says columns to display and it shows these little five blue boxes. Each box represents uh, an attribute or a column that will come out in the table. And in this case, uh, I might want to say reverse the order uh, of the allele public name and allele worm base ID. I, I just uh, want the worm base ID to the left of the public name in terms of columns in my output. So I just grab one of these and I, I pull it over and I can swap the order. So now that I have the worm base ID before the public name. And now I can click on show results and uh, this is what I'll get. Um, you can see we have um, 99,000 rows, almost 100,000 rows representing uh, all the alleles of transcription factor gene potentiality. Um, now, at this point, I'd like to point out a little potential gotcha or thing that can, can throw you off when querying for um, data from one line. Uh, note that the, the gene AHA1, in this case, uh, is repeated many times um, in the first three columns. And it's repeated once for every instance of an allele that comes up in the subsequent columns to the right. Now, uh, that's kind of expected in this type of query. You would expect that you know the gene name would be repeated over and over, and then you'd see uh, unique allele names on all the other uh, subsequent uh, columns uh, so that you get distinct results. Um, this can be a little bit problematic, for example, um, or quite problematic if you're trying to query across many different classes that are kind of independent of each other. So let's say I wanted all the transcription factor genes, I wanted all the transcription factor gene alleles, and I wanted all of their expression patterns. I could query for that. I could ask WormMind to re retrieve all of, the, all of that data. Uh, but because alleles and expression patterns don't correspond with each other, they don't really have any, they don't line up with each other. The default querying behavior is going to produce a table that looks like this, in which you now have the gene and the variation repeated over many rows, where in the final column we see the expression pattern, um, the unique set of expression patterns for that gene uh, listed in order. But then uh, again, you'll get the same list of expression patterns listed in order, but now you'll be repeating over the gene and the variation. So you can see that uh, there's now 596,000 rows in this table. It doesn't really need to be that large. It, uh, it's just the fact that um, with the default settings, um, querying with an inner join, which I'll explain soon. Uh, you end up with a table that just repeats uh, data over and over uh, somewhat needlessly. So be careful when querying across multiple uh, classes. Um, try to constrain your queries to just uh, one or two classes at a time, uh, unless you're, say, drilling down into a class and you're looking for the alleles of transcription factor genes and their associated phenotypes. Um, that That is a useful query. But this query where we're kind of looking for two uh, disparate types of data, um, you can end up with huge tables that have just lots of repetition um, unnecessarily. Okay, so just coming back to our results, this is the original results we had to show all the alleles for see all these transcription factor genes. Now I wanna point out how you can export the results uh, of a one line table. You can click on this export button to the right, um, and then you get a dialog box that allows you to download the file. Uh, you can download in a number of different files, uh, file types. Uh, some of them uh, 
fasta sequence gff3 features and so forth that only apply in certain circumstances uh, the standard is of course to download tab separated values or comma separated values you can also download an xml or json so now we'll click on download and we'll get the file and uh, i'll say open it up in excel and now i like to every time i talk about data mining um, platforms and pulling out lists of say C. elegans genes, I'd like to give this warning slide. Um, this applies to simple mine and worm mine and uh, uh, worm based parasite biomark. Whenever you pull out uh, a list of C. elegans gene names uh, in particular, uh, and you're not careful, when you import them into Excel or a spreadsheet program, you uh, often get these gene names displayed here will automatically be converted into dates or date objects within that spreadsheet program, and often irreversibly so. Um, and that can cause a lot of frustration if you don't notice it uh, right away and you start uh, transforming the data and converting it and processing it and doing all this other stuff, uh, you'll completely lose track of which gene name it is if you're relying on the gene name. So please, um, if you import data that you get from these data mining tools, if it includes C. elegans gene names, uh, make sure to import the content as text in the text format, not in the general default format, uh, that, so that you can avoid uh, these references being uh, gene names being turned into dates um, and, and not being able to get the original content back. Um, so you can also, when you have a results table in Wormine, you can also click on the Save as List button. Um, there's a couple of interesting features here. One is that it actually shows you the, the distinct count of those objects uh, in your table. So we can see this table has a, dis, uh, um, has a set of 1,075 distinct genes that turns out to be the same number of genes in the transcription factor list. And it has a total unique list of 94,348 alleles. Um, so Wormine has lists, as we already alluded to. You can import your own lists. You can also create lists from, from a results table like this. So if you had all of these alleles and you weren't necessarily interested in storing the genes um, right away, you could just click on the gene to allele association and create a new list in Wormine. You can name it anything you want and you'll have a list of all alleles for C. elegans transcription factor genes. Um, now, coming back to our query, um, I, I wanna mention this, which can also be a bit of a gotcha and um, you may not expect it. If you're, um, when you're querying across data classes and say you wanna pull in all genes and their alleles, um, whenever you, when you uh, traverse a, a data class from one to the other, Wormine needs to know how you want to join that data. Um, and so we, we have this little blue uh, white square and a blue circle icon that represents the join type with the join style. And this is an inner join by default. And what that means is it's only going to return you the list of genes that have alleles, have allele data. If you uh, keep the inner join and one of your genes doesn't have any alleles, you're going to get back the table, um, but it's going to be missing any of those genes that don't have that data. So that's called an inner join, uh, where you only get back the entities that have the data you're looking for. Um, and so you can click on this little blue icon and get a dialog box, and you can say, uh, choose the inner join, which is this top type, which says, so show only genes if they have an allele. Um, or show all genes and and, uh, and show alleles if they're present. So if, even if they're not, you still get the back the, the genes, um, but it will indicate that there are no alleles to show. So we can add this to the query. Now we have an outer join, and if we show the results, uh, this is what it looks like. Now each gene is on its own row, and the uh, set of alleles is actually collapsed into a single cell. You can click on one of these cells and expand it open and see a nested table. Um, uh, and maybe this is sometimes more in intuitive. Uh, this can also get complicated if you're querying across uh, multiple data types. But uh, just so you know, that's the distinction between an inner join and an outer join. Uh, if, you're, if you're using an inner join, you may not realize that you're losing, um, say, genes from 
that you're expecting to get back um, because they just happen not to have the data that you're also querying for. So uh, finally, um, well, all right, so there's a, let, let's further refine this, this query a little bit and say, I want all knockout alleles of transcription factor genes. Um, there's this attribute that alleles have in one line called KO consortium allele or knockout consortium allele. I'm gonna click on the constraint button, pull up this dialog box. I'm gonna set the value to true. It's just a Boolean, yes or no, true or false. I'm gonna add this to my query. And now um, I have, I say, give me all knockout consortium alleles of transcription factor genes. And now I get a much uh, smaller, more manageable list of 783 um, uh, genes to variation association uh, that finds uh, potential knockouts for these transcription factor genes. Uh, I also want to point out that we go back to the query and then scroll down a bit below the um, columns to display, there's this um, button export XML. And this is a, a very handy feature for sharing uh, queries with uh, other collaborators or with one day staff. You click on that and you'll just get to a, um, a page that just displays text. You can uh, copy this into your buffer, your clipboard um, and paste it into a text file um, or just keep it in your, uh, in your clipboard so that you can import it into um, WormMind. So if you get, if somebody gives you an XML query from WormMind like this, just copy it. Uh, come to WormMind Query Builder tab, click on the import query from XML, uh, and then paste in the query into the um, provided space. Click on submit, and you'll have reconstructed the query. Um, so uh, I think, how am I doing on time? I think I'm about out of time. Um, at this point, I thought I could take some questions or I could continue to talk about um, to do a little bit of a live demo showing some of the other features like lists and, um, and their functions. Um, we don't have chat. Yeah, Chris, we don't have any uh, questions in the chat. Maybe we can give the audience a couple of minutes to type in questions. If there are none, then you can go ahead with the live demo. So sure. please, everyone. Um, type in questions for Chris or for the warm based team in the chat. We should have prepared some Christmas carols <laughs> <laughs> to feel the silence. Well, um, while we're still waiting, I could certainly just go ahead and start sure. the live demo. That's okay. a good idea. All right. Um, so if you have any questions, of course, you can email us at help at wormbase.org. If you have questions about our data and the, the curated data, you can um, send an email to curation at wormbase.org. So here's the um, here's a live uh, presentation of the WS279 instance of uh, WormMind. Um, so we talked about the Query Builder tab and its functions. Here are all the classes that I refer to. There's about 70 different classes currently in WormMind. Um, there's a regions query, which I didn't cover so far. This allows you to um, paste in uh, coordinates, genomic coordinates, and you can get back a list um, of features that corresponds to each of those um, spans uh, of the genome. Uh, you can also expand um, on both sides the, the, the amount of sequence that you get as blanking. Um, the coordinates that you put in there. There's an API here. Uh, there's some API documentation um, for Perl, Python, Ruby, and Java. Uh, you may have noticed that if we um, perform a query, and I'm just going to choose one of the template queries here and, and uh, return it, um, you can see it says generate Python code. You can choose what script, what language uh, you want, uh, or format like XML. Um, and you can click on that, it'll generate uh, the code that you need for your uh, API request. Um, and you can put that into your code as needed. Um, so um, the templates are basically all queries built in Query Builder um, that uh, you can then open up and you can click on edit query. You can see how the query is constructed based on the model browser. You can, um, you can modify constraints 
So I could click on this edit constraints and I could either change the name of the gene or a constraint on a list of genes. Um, so that's often a good way to learn about query building is to look at the templates, which are available on the home page or on the templates tab here. Uh, this should be the full list of template queries available. Now the list tab I haven't um, really described so far and I'd like to show you. Now there's two main tabs for lists. Usually it defaults to this upload um, list in which you can upload uh, a list of entities of any class in worm, uh, worm mine um, using the proper identifiers, the most reliable things to include the primary identifiers, but you can also put in for genes like gene names and so forth. Um, and you, you can click here to see an example. It could be a comma separated list. It could be one item on each line, uh, however you see it. Uh, in general, I would suggest leaving the species, uh, the four organism um, drop down alone, just leave it on any, unless it's really important um, that, and you don't think that the, what you're providing in the list would be um, distinctive enough. Um, so then you can create your list. So there's a simple example list, I'll create, click on create list. Uh, it tells me that it found, I entered six identifiers, it found six genes, uh, I can name this list uh, anything that I want. I'll just call it sample list. Um, click on save a list of six genes. And now I'll see um, basically the default, some default information about each gene uh, in a results table here. If I now go over to lists and click on view, I'll see um, in purple my private set of lists, uh, a, li a list of six genes here. Um, which I could click on again to see the results, um, or I could uh, perform various operations. When it's private um, for your, your session or you're logged in, it'll look, come up in purple like this, meaning it's a private list. Uh, all of these other lists are public lists um, built on the WormMind Worm staff account. Uh, here's the C. elegans transcription factor genes list I talked about. What's uh, quite useful is that um, WormMind, uh, InterMind in general, provides some um, list operation functions uh, in which you can um, you can choose a couple of different lists of genes, for example, and look for the intersection or the subtraction. Um, uh, so let me take an example here. Um, so here are genes. There are 27 genes uh, as of the WS257 release that have a cell cycle uh, variant or descendant allele phenotype. Um, and then I have the C. elegans transcription factor genes. Let's say I want to see if there are any transcription factor genes in this list of um, genes that have a cell cycle variant uh, phenotype. Um, I can then click on intersect. Once I had two lists collected, I'll say, um, cell cycle uh, uh, TF genes and just save that. Uh, oh, it produced no results. So apparently there aren't any transcription factors in cell cycle uh, phenotypes reported. So um, at least as of this um, release. But you get the idea. You can do subtract, intersect, union. Um, operations. Uh, let's do a union just for the sake of uh, demonstration. Uh, actually, this might be a more interesting. Let's just look at genes with a lethal or descended phenotype. Um, and then we'll look at the transcription factor genes which intersect. So I'll say lethal TF genes. And there we go. There's a list of 217 transcription factor genes in C. elegans that uh, have a known or reported lethal phenotype. Um, so now when you're, at least for your session, or if you're logged in, you'll get, um, uh, you, you can do these operations on various lists, uh, including private lists. Um, once you leave WormMind, if you're not logged in, these private lists will uh, disappear uh, as your cache is refreshed. Um, so I see, I don't know uh, if someone wants to bring up questions. I see a, a question from Michael Shapira. Um, in the past, warm mine was a bit slow, so every one of those steps you showed could take a long time, reducing the ease of use. How is it now? Um, in my experience, um, 
the warm mind is very quick, as you can see. Um, it just, I, I should point out, as I said before, there are certain reasons where, um, kind of for practical reasons, you can end up with a very, um, with a very slow query. Like if I, for example, if I said, I want all genes uh, in the database and I want all alleles, note that there are about 2 million alleles in the database. So for classes that have um, a large number of entries um, like, like alleles, uh, you can, if you're looking up all genes, all alleles and all their associations to each other, that might take some time. Uh, if you further complicate it by, uh, say, adding in, you know, expression patterns or RNAi results, these things that are kind of uh, orthogonal, you, you can end up with an overly um, redundant, complex table involving many, many millions of rows, uh, and that can slow it down. So that could be one reason that it's uh, suffering in terms of speed. Uh, I have not had um, any issues in terms of speed uh, lately. Um, so just on that note, I'll, I'll point out here, here's a simple, um, the simplest query we could do for the allele class. So I went to Query Builder, I double clicked on allele, um, I'm pulling up worm base ID, and now I'm gonna show results. Now, keep in mind, this is 2 million results, uh, and it's gonna, uh, we'll see how long it takes. So it only took a couple of seconds to return 2,127,000 rows. Uh, so, uh, in my experience, it's pretty fast right now. Um, you just have to, um, yeah, make sure you're not performing an uh, unnecessarily complicated query that could be uh, slowing down the machine. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I wanted, yeah, sorry, I just wanted to officially um, introduce Karen, who is moderating in the chat, even if we don't have. Uh, much going on. So, Karen. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry, my interconnect, my internet connection is acting up again. So, yeah, if, if anyone has a sample um, query that you'd like Chris to demonstrate, uh, please write it in the chat. Uh, we do have another question uh, from Alejandra. Uh, is, it, is it also that fast to export? Um, so let me demonstrate. I'll do the query again. Uh, I've got a timer here, so let's see how, yeah. All right, so it's cached, so it's super fast that time. Um, now, if I want to export, I'm just going to export in the default tab delimited file um, and then click download file. And you can see in the bottom left of my browser, maybe, uh, that it is loading. So the load, the download operation uh, kicks in pretty quickly. Um, at this point, it looks a little bit slower than usual in terms of, you know, KB or uh, MP per second. Um, so that might take a little while to download. That could be my internet connection. Is, uh, do we have Paolo on the call? I don't know if he can speak to um, download speeds if there's a, a throttling or a threshold. No, Paulo, I didn't see Paulo on. Okay. Raymond wrote to the group, do not write us when you see something slow, thanks. Uh, I think he's joking. If you see something slow, please let us know. Um, we would like to know if we can improve the performance uh, of these things. Um, so it, I'm still only at about three megabytes of download for this. I'm not sure why it's uh, so slow. It's usually faster than that. Um, uh, but generally, this should be uh, pretty quick. Uh, so, Chris, can you, yep. is there data that isn't in Warmine? Or oh. Oh, should, should Warmine queries be really be focused on certain types of data? I mean, you, you showed the list of data types, right? Mm -hmm. But what isn't in more mind? What, what can it be used for? Oh, uh, what can't it be used for? Uh, right now, we do not have interactions, for example. Okay. Uh, so molecular 
our physical interactions, genetic interactions, regulatory interactions, or predictive interactions won't be here. Uh, what else? Uh, there's another question that came up. Is there information somewhere with text information of all the different classes and attributes? Um, basically, well, for uh, is the question about worm base or worm mine or either or both? Uh, it, in worm mine, the answer is basically look at the query builder and open up um, the the model browser here, and you should see everything all of the attributes that are associated to at least one of those objects. So there, um, there's also, notice here, a show empty fields option. If you click on that, you can actually pull up additional uh, fields that for whatever reason um, are, are just not populated. Like for example, interaction. Interaction is something that uh, means, uh, but we don't have it currently populated. Um, so if you want to see a list of what's available in terms of what's actually associated to one of those class instances, um, uh, then uh, you can look here. In, in WormBase, uh, I'll just briefly point out, we have something called um, tree display. And if you open up a WormBase gene page and you go down to this widget called tree display, you'll see um, the kind of HDD view of how these data are associated. If you click on view schema, you actually see the, 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 the general schema that shows you which, um, uh, what attributes that object has and what it connect, can connect to. Um, but that's not, so, and that's for WormBase. That's WormBase, right. For WormMind, I would really just look at the model browser for each class. Um, Peter Askier has a question. Yeah. Yep. Uh, can you extract genomic coordinates uh, also related to older worm-based releases. For the older worm-based releases, you're not going to really be able to get it out of WormMine. WormMine only holds data for a given release. Um, but yes, you can extract genomic coordinates. Um, we have a um, we have this query, which is transcript to chromosomal position. But let me show you quick, quickly how to do this with the gene class. You uh, first you want some basic attributes of the gene, like the, the ID and the name. Uh, then you can come down to chromosome location and chromosome. Um, it's a little uh, quirky, but you need to open both of these. For the chromosome, you want word base ID. Um, uh, and then for chromosome location, I'll open again. I'll want the uh, strands, which I'll click on show, the start, and the end. And then um, let's say I'm just interested in C. elegans. Again, I'll constrain the species to C. elegans and get the results. While we're waiting, Chris, so you, you posted a link to a, a Google Sheet with comparison, comparing other um, query tools. Yes. Can you post uh, that in the chat so people can? Yes, I'll put that in the chat right now. Um, we also have another query question, so after you're done. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay, so this is the uh, results back um, for all the genes in C. elegans and their coordinates. And uh, there's 47,000 genes. Note that this number is a little bit less than we saw before for C. elegans genes, because note that not all genes are cloned. Um, Okay, so there was another question about, um, can you show how to generate a list of C. elegans guanylyl cyclase genes with orthologs in a parasitic species? Okay, yes, and I'm gonna try to do this as quickly as I can because we're running out of time. Um, what I would suggest is um, going to our Go term and go to this uh, gene ontology template query, Go term and term subtypes. Um, let's put um, guanylyl, site place, I get that right, activity, I hope that works. Let's see, no. And I'm gonna say contains. <clears throat> And the point here, um, the reason I'm doing this query right now is that 
Um, uh, one looks like this. Uh, okay, it must be a it's Kimberly on the call. It must be a Go term for a molecular function that says that's guanylyl cyclase. Uh, guanylate cyclase activity. Thank you, Raymond. Okay, so I'm going to change the constraint to say um, equals this. And so what I'm what this qu template query does, it looks for guanylate cyclase activity and any more specific terms that might be in the ontology. So there might not be any more. No, it doesn't look like it. Um, so this is a, a so that actually makes things easier. So now I'll go to um, and and you want orthologs. So all C. elegans ortholog gene, genes with orthologs in a different species. Uh, I know we're just about out of time. What I want to show here is you can go to the gene query um, for query builder, go to the Go annotation, uh, open up ontology term, and uh, I'm going to constrain the name of the ontology term to be monolate cyclase activity. Um, Uh, I also do want to check that one base. Maybe the last 20 seconds, Chris. Yes, yes, sorry. Um, so then you can get this list like this. So this will give you all genes. Um, I'll constrain the organism to C. elegans. Um, so we have guanylate cyclase genes in C. elegans, and then you also want uh, orthologs in a parasitic species. I'll say homologs. I'll expand the homologs section, say uh, the genes that I want back. I'm going to constrain the organism to uh, do Ascaris or uh, Homonchus contortus. I'll say add to query, um, but make sure you also include for that homologous gene the gene ID sequence name, gene name, for example. And now I'll click show results. And there are none. Let me change the species. There just may not be anything in there. Um, also, let's try a closer species just for proof of principle. Nope. Um, okay, yeah, sorry, I couldn't do that more quickly. It looks like this gene. All right, so here are all the genes, 126 genes in C. elegans. Uh, you should be able to get some type of ortholog. Um, I should also point out that we can constrain the type to be uh, ortholog, or at least diverged ortholog. And then we want the gene ID. Let's see if that pulls out anything in any other species. Okay. Um, yeah, like I think we, we can wait for the results. Um, and then, John, if you uh, have additional questions and uh, we won't manage to do it here, please reach out at help at warmbase.org. Uh, I'd like to close the meeting now. Thanks again for joining us today. Thank you, Chris, for the excellent presentation. Um, we hope you enjoyed today's webinar. Um, our next webinar will be on Parasite Biomart and is scheduled for Monday, January 11th, 2021 at 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And on behalf of Warmbase team, I would like to wish you all happy holidays. Thanks again. Bye.